Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Christy. I'm with Savannah Institute, and I wanted to just say a, a little bit about the Savannah Institute. We're a nonprofit organization, and our focus is really research and education about agroforestry. Um, and agroforestry can look like a bunch of different things to different people, but in general, it's a practice that uses trees to produce crops that help make farms be more profitable, more resilient, heal the environment. And a lot of our work is doing research in cooperation with farmers, connecting farms um, and farmers to scientists um, and universities and other organizations. We also host some events, educational events like the one you're joining tonight, um, as well as in-person events such as field days, uh, the perennial farm gathering, which is our big annual gathering so people can share what worked on their farm, maybe what didn't work so well, and, and really have a great time connecting with other people. And that will be December 8th, um, it looks like. So that's a date to put on your calendar if you're interested. And so as an introduction tonight, I'm going to play a video here of Harry's farm, Huck Orchard and, and Gardens here which I think does a really nice job introducing uh, the work that they're doing there. I'm Jackie Hoke, and my husband and I run Hoke Orchard and Gardens down in the southeastern part of Minnesota, um, pretty close to the Mississippi River. What we have is a fully diversified organic and biodynamic farming system. Our primary crop is apples, but we do things like sweet cherries and peaches and apricots and plums and strawberries and raspberries. Our focus is fruit, but when you farm in a very biodiverse way, you have a lot more than just the focus of fruit. We try to farm this farm as if it was one entity. So the waste that we have needs to be fed back into the farm to grow the farm. Every apple is used, whether the apple is used fresh for a consumer or whether it's used for a processed product or whether it's used for juice or whether it's fed to the pigs. We are not going to walk through the orchard and see apples still left on the tree. All the apples get picked and if the apples fell to the ground, then the pigs go through and eat the apples that fell on the ground. That helps us disrupt pest cycles, but it also helps us build up the farm and has better utilization of the fruit. We're keeping what's in this farm, in this ecosystem, building upon itself. So wherever we can, we're trying to keep that system as close to a natural ecosystem as possible and yet have the production of it. If, as consumers, we're keeping our money closer to home, then we're supporting businesses that can then support more jobs and then from the perspective of this farm, if this farm is healthy and I can hire 10 people versus 8 or 2 or 1, um, though all of those things help our economy. So from my perspective, wherever you can spend your money locally, you should. It's about choosing the life you want to have. You know, if you're making all of your choices based on money alone, that's not a good thing. But if you're only making choices based on principle alone, that's not a good thing either. You have to come up with a balance that says, how can I do this? How can I sustain my life? And maybe my checkbook's not as fat as someone else's, but if my life is full, then I'm okay. But I have to pay my bills. <laughs> Selling to co-ops has been part of what's been able to make our business be a sustainable business because we develop relationships and partnerships with the co-op to be able to say, here's a menu of items that we have. Can you work with us? And we purchase those things. We've never had a contract with any co-op we've worked with. We've had relationships. If we provide a good product consistently and they value the type of farm that we have, it continues on. Valuing local farmers and valuing the type of farms is important. And so having that co-op support that then translates to customers being able to trust that their food's coming from places that they value to. here. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, this is Carrie, uh, and he'll be talking about how he turns uh, waste into gold. Okay, I guess it's my turn to talk. 
So I'm going to be talking about uh, the different types of mowers that I use for chopping brush uh, and cleaning up all of the prunings in the orchards. Um, there are a lot of different types of brush choppers, mowers, flail mowers. Uh, I'm just going to go through the, the three types that I have, but that pretty much covers um, all, the, all the types that are commercially available. So I have an old single blade rotary. This is the first the first chopper that I had, and I used it for years. Um, now I just kind of use it as a backup. Also have a 10-foot uh, a wide double blade rotary. Uh, it works good in the old, the big old orchards. And then I have a 7-foot flail mower. Now when you're looking for purchasing a mower or, or borrowing one to use for uh, for brush chopping, you definitely want to get one that is set up specifically for uh, working with brush or a heavy-duty mower. Uh, the lightweight mowers you get at, at Farm and Fleet or King Cutters or that sort of thing, they might chop up the brush for a while, but the decks aren't made to take the hits from the bigger pieces of wood and the occasional rock that throws up. Um, the bearings aren't made to take the jarring. Um, so if you just get a cheap mower, you, you might be able to chop the branches for a while, but it'll only be a matter of time before the, before the unit comes apart on you. So you always want to look for heavy-duty virgin, um, and, and even some of the heavy-duty mowers, you can get different blades for them. There'll be a, a grass blade, which is much lighter and, and flared up, so it causes a vacuum when you're mowing, and it sucks the grass up and gives you a straighter, cleaner cut, but not as good for chopping brush. The chopping brush blades are usually uh, twice as thick uh, and more flat. And then in the in the flail mowers, you can get flails that are are lightweight and sharp and made for grass cutting. Or you can get hammers, which are basically great big, more blunt objects, and and they basically hit the twigs against the the teeth that are in the inside of the casing of the flail. Um, uh, the other thing you want to look for is the ability to close the discharge on the mower because if you're using a big deck mower and it's got an open side on it, a lot of these branches are just going to throw out the side of it and nothing's going to chop up completely. So here's a picture of the, um, the single blade rotary mower that I have. Mine's an old uh, Woods is the brand. It's a 172. It's just... Uh, six feet wide and it's offset so it doesn't follow right behind the mower and on this one it's a fixed offset so other than adjusting how your three-point um, is uh, set up on the tractor there's no adjustment to it and then uh, this one also has a swivel wheel on the back so that you can uh, adjust your your minimum height So here's just a couple of pictures of how the three-point is fixed to the bottom, to the deck of the uh, the mower, and here's the the wheel that um, adjusts the height. And you can see there's adjustment holes and bolts. Um, so if you want to keep from scalping the ground, if you've got rough ground, you can set this wheel down farther. And here's a good view of uh, how the mower offsets from the tractor. And this mower is set up on a a uh, 4640, so a 46 horsepower Kubota, and that runs this mower without without a problem. Here's just another picture in one of the smaller orchards, and here's one of the orchards that's uh, only on a 15 foot row spacing, so the tractor and the mower fits real nicely through there. The problem with these uh, uh, rotary mowers is they don't chop up everything into little chips. So you can see the picture here, and it's not that I'm a bad photographer, but I did put my, my foot in the photo so you could have a, a little reference to the size of the chips. So there's small branches and everything laying there. They just they don't spring up, though. They're just kind of laying on the ground. So the pros and cons of a single-blade mower uh, they're nice and narrow, so you can get them into your tightest plantings. Um, they'll, they'll chop better than a big wide mower, 
but not as well as a flail mower. Um, horsepower is minimal, so you could put one of these on a 25 or a 30 horsepower tractor. Um, and you can always go slower if you don't have enough horsepower, and, or you can go over multiple times if you've got a real small tractor. Um, cost of these, this would be the lowest cost of any equipment for chopping branches. Uh, and the nice thing about this type of mower on the, on the three-point and small size is you can lift it up, and if you've got big piles of branches, you can drive backwards over the pile. So you're chopping up as you're moving along, because um, sometimes the big piles of brush are hard to drive over, and they rip, rip apart the wires and the lines and everything on your tractor. And this little mower is, is pretty pretty simple design, minimal parts. There's just one gearbox on it uh, and a drive shaft and a deck. So it's easy to fix up if you break it or things wear out. Uh, the limitations, though, the cons of this type of mower is uh, most of the single blade mowers, I think about the biggest you can get is seven feet wide. And it's going to require a three-point hitch. So if you've got an older tractor that doesn't have a three-point, um, this system isn't going to work. You'd have to have a, a, a pull type that will just hook up to your, your tractor's drawbar. Um, you can, you can br uh, chop up big, wide piles, but it takes multiple passes with a, a mower like this. And uh, as I said before, it, it just doesn't chop as fine as a flail mower. So the other mower I use is a Woods 10-foot, and this is a, a double-bladed mower. So there's there's two 5-foot blades in this deck. Um, it's got a, a hitch that just hooks right up to the, to the drawbar of the tractor, and then there's a hydraulic ram that I can, that adjusts the height. So there's two wheels in the back, and this ram will, will push the wheels down, lifting the deck of the mower up. Um, if you don't have hydraulics on a mower like this, you can uh, you can just get a crank. Um, it would be um, a threaded a threaded attachment that would bolt in where the ram is, and then you can adjust it up and down by hand. But you can't really do that while you're mowing. But if you uh, if you don't have hydraulics, you can crank the thing up all the way, drive over the big piles, and then when you're done with all the piles, then you could crank it back down so it's hugging the ground and go back over a second time. One of the older mowers I had used to be set up that way. And then this mower is offset, but it's a fixed offset. It's not adjustable. So here you can see the mower is uh, hooked up to a, a big old early 1980s Massey Ferguson tractor. And the hitch is, you can't move this hitch along along the, uh, the deck of the mower. So one thing you need to keep in mind, and I found this out, I, I bought a 10-foot mower like this, and uh, there's no way I could use it in 15 or even 18-foot plantings because it offsets so far. So you're hitting your branches of your trees on the other side so uh, a big mower like this is good if you've got 20 foot, 30 foot, 40 foot rows. But you try to take this down the down a, a narrow planting of whatever trees it is you've got in the ground. You're going to be hitting them with uh, with the inside wheel of the tractor. Here's a picture of the hydraulic ram that lifts the the uh, deck up and down. And this is just a photo I took so you can see the height of this tractor. Um, so it drives over the branches pretty well. The um, Most of the tractors that I, the modern tractors that I have are all compact orchard tractors and they don't have as much clearance. And here's just a picture of what happens when you're driving over a lot of brush. You can get a lot of brush tangled up behind the tractor and wrapped up in the PTO and sometimes you just have to stop and, and uh, pull some of those branches out. So the uh, this is side-by-side uh, -side pictures in a, in one of the big old orchards that I rent. These are standard size apple trees that we're renovating. And you can see on the left the big piles of brush underneath there. In fact, I think I'd already run over the pile once, so there's a lot of branches there. And then the picture on the right, all the branches are, are chopped up. So you can you can see what an old mower like that will do.
And here's an area where we actually cut down some trees that were that were too close to the to the roadway here and chopped up these huge piles of brush. So every bit of brush, you know, other than the firewood that you can see piled up by the trees, this was all chopped down uh, with a mower like this. And there's another picture. You can see quite a bit bigger pieces of wood than with the smaller mower. Uh, the reason is that the big mower covers a much wider space, and if there's any low spots or swales um, that uh, the blades aren't going to be as close to the ground. So a lot of big sticks get through on a mower like this. So it would probably be a good time to, uh, to look at one of the videos of this uh, you, so you can actually see how it chops up and what kind of a job it does. So Christy, if you want to play um, brush chopping number two, uh, and they can actually see this thing running. The brush chopping video number two is um, in a block on my, my main farm. Okay, now I can see the video. And uh, in this orchard, we cut off the middles of the trees to regraft, so there's a lot of branches in there. So this old mower is, is really chopping down the brush. It would have taken days to, to pick up all these branches and haul them out with a wagon. And I was trying to video this as I was driving. I tried to show, you can see the size of some of the branches that are being chopped up by this machine. So if you're growing nut trees or uh, or wood fire or production for uh, lumber and you want to do a lot of trimming, um, a machine like this is going to probably be the best best option because you can, like I said, you can really chop up a lot of wood. And even if it's a hardwood, apple is a fairly hard wood, not as hard as as hickory or something like that, but it's more like red oak. But if the wood is too is really hard, you can just drive slower and it'll it'll chip it up and do a good job. The next video number three. So this is in a, a standard orchard that I'm renting and renovating, and we went over the the pile one time already with this um, with this mower. Now I'm going back a second time with it set down even lower. So this would be the, the finish cutting. But you can still see the size of some of the sticks going into that mower. And when I, well here I'm viewing forward so you can kind of get an idea of what kind of stuff I'm chopping. And number four, video number four has a little bit more on, on the finishing chopping. So in this one you can see what's going into the mower a little bit more clearly than the last one. You can see some pretty big pieces going in there. Again, here we're back we're back to the orchard where we had done the grafting, changing the variety, so a lot of brush was cut out here. So this old orchard was uh, a lot of Cortland trees, and we're switching them over to hard cider varieties. So the pros and cons of a, a double blade mower, obviously you've got, um, you can cover much more area with a big double blade mower. Um, and with a, with a mower like mine that's offset, you can reach far under the trees, so if you're, um, 
trimming up trees, you can just let the branches fall and the mower will reach most of them. Um, not a lot of passes to take on even a 40-foot row. Um, I mentioned earlier that the fixed offset doesn't allow you to um, to take the big mower into smaller plantings. Uh, if you're buying something new, um, you should be able to find uh, adjustable offset. So that just means the three-point hitch or the or the drawbar can be uh, moved in or out on the mower. So that gives you a lot more versatility. And these big mowers can chop up a lot of big branches. So you can you can saw off two three-inch diameter limbs. Uh, problems with these big wide mowers, like I said before, they they don't chop evenly. So if if you've got something like key line design and there's big even small swales and and ridges that you're trying to drive over a big mower like this is going to be really difficult to work over those ridges because uh, if you've got trees on one side of the swale or the ridge um, and this big mower is going over the top of it you're either going to be skipping cutting the top off of the ridge or there's going to be two feet of unchopped branches you know in the bottom of your swale and with uh, with a drawbar mower, uh, backing it up is almost impossible for any length of any distance. Um, you can back them up, turn them around, but uh, to try to back down an alley, it just it doesn't work at all. If you've got a three-point hitch and a smaller mower, you can just lift up and back into an area or back out an area. But uh, a big mower with a with a drawbar is impossible to go down an alley. And a mower like this is going to require 50 horsepower or more. Uh, probably 80 would be better. And one problem I have on my orchards, you saw from the video, we've got a lot of side hills. And if it's a little bit wet and you're pulling a mower like this, it can slide down the hill and into the tree. So it's running at, a, at an angle to your tractor instead of pulling right behind. So flail mowers. Um, what I have is a, a Dutch mower uh, called the the brand is Perfect. Um, what I have is a seven foot. It's a nice piece of equipment. It's got hammers for chopping brush. Uh, the rear the rear uh, roller um, can be adjusted up and down, and that opens up the gate or the space in the back where the chips come out. So if I want to use this mower for for mowing grass, we can set the rear roller very low and it'll throw all the grass out at the back instead of chopping it into little pieces. And if you're running a flail mower on a, on a smaller engine tractor, you don't want to try to chop up all the grass. You just want to throw it out. Um, and then when you're chopping your brush, you close that gate up and then just drive real slow. And on this one, there's adjustable offset, and you can see it's hooked up to the three-point hitch. Uh, this is just a couple of pictures of the of one of the real small plantings. Uh, you can see some of the branches in there. And in this picture, we we chop the picture on the right. We chop the brush up for uh, a ways, and then um, and you can see where we didn't chop. And here's just a couple of pictures of the of the mower going into the orchard. And here's here's a closer picture of the branches all chopped up. We've got a few videos uh, that we could look at. Um, they're not very long, but you can see the how the flail works compared to that big old old-fashioned mower. So it was a little bit dry. You could see it was kicking up some dust, but it was really, really chipping up stuff small. The next one is uh, number five, and you can just see it mowing some grass. There is some brush in that, and you can see there's no chips or anything that you can see. Now the last video I've got is about 20 seconds, and we're just going to walk along and see the 
see the chips on the ground, see what the what a flail does. So that's number seven. And there's my little terrier. But you can see when a when a flail mower goes over it, there's almost nothing left, just little pieces. And and even if you're running over big stuff, um, you know, this wasn't a very big pile. You can see here the branches that were not chopped yet. But uh, even if if I were to run this over the uh, um, those big pieces uh, left over when we went over with the big chopper, um, it would still come out like that, just little chips laying on the ground. So if your concern is having a nice clean alley and when you're done, then a, a flail mower is really what you're going to want to use. So pros and cons of the flail mower. Uh, the best part is that it really chips things into small pieces uh, and things start breaking down really fast and gets into the soil even quicker. can handle really big pieces of wood up to three inches. Um, if you want to maneuver in and out of a row, it can be lifted up um, and you can also lift it up if you're going to go over big piles. It's easy to back up and maneuver around. Uh, problem is, uh, these mowers are, are really expensive. This little seven foot one is probably is going to cost you quite a bit more than that 10 foot, a brand new 10 foot double blade mower. They're also very heavy. Uh, so even if you can run it on a small 45 or 50 horsepower tractor, you're going to have to weight the front of your tractor or, or you're going to pop wheelies with this thing. Um, so you really should have a higher than a 50 horse tractor. That John Deere that was running it, that's uh, while it looks small, it's an 85 horsepower orchard vineyard tractor. So it's real compact and real heavy. And while you can drive these things backwards, they won't chop in reverse. Uh, the you need the hammers turning in the right direction in order to chop the branches. So if you lift this up and go backwards over your pile, it just kind of throws the branches out of the way and doesn't doesn't chop them up. So the the pros and cons overall of using choppers, um, and I guess this is a lot of opinion on my part, but I, I think it's extremely time efficient. I can I can mow acres of of branches in a day. I mean, 10 acres, 15 acres. Um, if the branches are already pulled out of the tree and laying on the ground, even driving real slow, it's um, it's a very time efficient way of taking care of your of your prunings. And in my estimate, you're going to use equal or less fuel than if you were to pick up all these branches on a wagon and have a crew of three or four people working for several days to pick up the branches and take them out to uh, to chip them by hand or, or to burn them. And what I really like is uh, my soils, you know, in my organic orchards are very active. There's a lot, a lot of uh, activity in the soil. And these chipped up apple branches break down and are, are gone. And most in most cases, you can't even see any of the branches by the end, by the time you're in apple harvest. And another another positive is, um, you know, while you're taking all the brush, all the prunings out, you're also mowing your grass. And if you've got volunteer shrubs, uh, raspberries, uh, box elder, whatever, uh, these mowers are going to knock that stuff right down to the ground. So you're you're cleaning up as um, you're, you're cleaning up stuff that's growing on your on your floor um, while you're also taking out your prunings. The negatives, I would say, one of the bigger negative is you re, you require a skilled operator. You can't just have some local kid jump on the tractor and do this chopping, or you're going to end up with injuries and lots of broken equipment. Um, you have to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, and these are dangerous pieces of equipment, but if you stay on the tractor, um, nobody's going to get hurt. The uh, rule on my farm is uh, nobody gets out of a tractor if a PTO is running. I don't have any equipment that that is is run with a with a tractor that stops. So uh, stay on the tractor if it's running. Uh, this equipment can also be really hard on the tractor. Uh, 
branches get up into the tractor. Um, it requires quite a bit of horsepower, and it's a varying, jarring type of of, uh, of use because as the piles are thicker and thinner or you chop lower to the ground, it uh, puts a lot, of, a lot of stress on the drivetrain of the tractor. Uh, the other thing is that if you're chopping things close to the ground, you can dislodge rocks or pieces of firewood or, or anything that you've left on the ground that you didn't know was there. Um, and it can, while well, the brush usually chops up and falls in place, if you get something big in there, it can ricochet uh, forward or ricochet out the back and go flying. Um, and these, you know, this type of chopping, if you've got uneven ground, uh, you'll be scalping and tearing up your, your sods your ground covers. So a few tips that I have is to, to wrap it up here. Uh, if you can, use a tractor with high ground clearance. I, I showed you the picture that uh, of the old Massey Ferguson that we had on the, the two-blade mower. Um, that works really well. Um, the other thing is if you if you have an older, very simple tractor, that's the best thing to use for this type of, um, of farm use. Uh, the more you chop brush, the more chances are that a branch is going to slip up or slap up into your tractor, um, especially big branches that have a big Y on them. Um, one, one side might get run over by the tractor and then the other side gets slipped up into the bottom. Um, it can hook onto external wires, hoses, hydraulic lines. Um, all of that stuff is vulnerable to the branches. Uh, what I like to do is if we're, if we're uh, cutting up um, prunings from, from a major renovation, we like to go through with, with small chainsaws and cut out all the larger pieces. If it's more than about two inches in diameter, we like to cut that out and throw it to the side. Or even if it's just one, two inch, but it's you know a big Y-shaped branch, so if you step on one laying it on the ground and the other side is sticking up into the air four or five feet, if you just cut that in half so both pieces lay down, that works a lot better for chopping brush. And of course, uh, you don't want anybody around, anybody watching when this is going on because branches can fly, rocks can fly, pieces of wood can fly. Um, and it's interesting. It makes a heck of a lot of noise. If anybody's around, they're going to walk right up to see what's going on. And if, if you don't see them there, uh, it, could, it could end badly. Uh, don't pile the brush real high. Uh, leave it spread out if possible. So if you've got wide rows and a tractor that can drive right over it, don't windrow it. Just, just leave the branches loose and make a couple more passes. Uh, it'll be easier on the tractor and... Uh, uh, and uh, you'll have a lot less problems with these great big piles. Um, the other tip I mentioned before, if you have a big tall pile in a narrow row, you can um, lift up your mower if you're using a, a three-point mower and back over it, chopping the branches as you go. So you're driving over the, the half-chopped pile um, instead of driving over a big tall pile. And always drive slow. Uh, the faster you go, the more force that these branches are going to fling up into the tractor, and that's before they get into the chopper. Uh, and they can, they can, it's amazing what they can get into. They can shove up into the fender. They can get caught on different um, hangers for your um, hydraulic lines and your in your water lines, and they just get shoved up into everywhere. You can even push them up into the radiator. Um, so I just tend to drive slow, then there's less chance of something slapping up and, and jumping up into the tractor. Um, I always avoid working on wet ground, uh, especially in the spring before your ground cover is really in place. You can do a lot of damage. You know, the mower smooths it back out, but you're compacting your soil. Uh, you're damaging the microorganisms, and, uh, and uh, it's really best to either either wait until the ground is dried out. Or the other thing that I've done in some cases, is if you're trying to get in there early and the snow has melted off, if the, if the ground's frozen in the morning, you can drive over and uh, things chop really well on frozen ground. It can't shove down into the, into the soil. So 
It does work really well on frozen ground and you're not compacting the soil because it just really doesn't budge. So that's that's all that I've got for the for the PowerPoint. I guess we can switch to questions. So Harry, I had a um, couple of questions as I was watching. Is it does it matter if if the branches that you're putting in directional um, should they be all facing kind of the same way or does it does it matter for the for the branches the orientation doesn't matter much if if they're short branches um, but what I found is if the branches are longer you know if, if you've cut uh, long water sprouts or big branching water sprouts that are you know eight ten feet long you want to lay those down um, parallel to the rows so the tractor will drive over it and, uh, and and the end of the branch will feed into the chopper because whether it's a flail mower or a rotary once the blade catches it it'll it'll pull it into the mower but if it's if it's crossways and you drive over you know if you've got a six foot wide mower and a ten foot long branch and it's and it's perpendicular to the mower you might just chop the the uh, the twigs off of it and the main part of the branch is just going to lay there and then the other half you know is going to get drug along or 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 pushed outside of the mower and outside of your reach okay um, and I so I've never um, been a part of an orchard um, and so I'm really new to to the uh, concept of pruning and, and everything. Um, do you prune your orchard in the fall or in the spring? Um, and then how how long do you wait between pruning to, to get out there? It sounds like you get out there in the spring either um, before it thaws or after the grasses kind of cover everything. Well, the first part of your question, we we try to prune the orchards every year, and the majority of the orchards are pruned when they're dormant. Uh, the training of a real young planting, some of that is done in the spring, but that's uh, less low volume of branches. That's not anything you need to use the the brush chopper for. Uh, sometimes on older orchards, on less dwarfing rootstock will do some summer pruning of of water sprouts and they're usually very succulent so you can throw them right down and just your regular grass mowing will take care of them um, and as far as brush cleanup for the for the dormant pruning we try to focus on on pruning all winter long so we'll start in december and work all the way through march um, and a lot of times you know we are covered with a lot of snow and you can't really pull the branches out of the trees or even throw them in the piles when there's too much snow in the orchard. We can prune when there's a couple feet of snow on the ground but you can't really deal with pulling the prunings out. The other issue is if we're pulling the prunings out of the trees and throwing them into the aisles and trying to get them away from the trunks of the trees, if you do it too soon before you chop up the brush, the winds can blow the branches around and kind of spread the piles back out because we can get some really heavy winds here in the spring. So usually the timing is March or April when we're doing our brush chopping. And how long have you been doing the chopping? Oh, with different types of equipment and different orchards, probably close to 30 years. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Is there um, one piece of advice that you would... Like what? What's one thing that you wish you would have known 30 years ago when you first started? Well, given I was pretty young 30 years ago, uh, <laughs> just slow down. Yeah. <laughs> the, the faster you go with the brush chopping, the more things you break. And so it sounds like the the branches break down pretty quickly. I look at it as our our whole orchard is is a big active compost pile. So we take as little as possible out of the orchard. And we actually, in our system, we, we don't 
fertilize the trees with compost or anything. We, we use a lot of inoculants, uh, compost teas, uh, trying to build up the, the proper balance of the right types of bacteria and fungus in the soil to work in this woodland type environment. So the, uh, the soil is, is very active and, and we have a diversity of plants growing in the orchard floor and we we time our mowings um we don't keep the place looking like a golf course in fact uh the maximum height i have for letting my grass get long is so it doesn't cover the headlights on the tractor so if we have to spray at night we can still see and then we also mow alternate rows so when we do go through and mow the orchard we're never mowing the entire block we're doing every other row and then we wait for the uh the mowed rows to start showing some some flowering before we go and mow the other rows. So there's always always uh, nectar sources for beneficial insects. And with this inconsistent or timed mowing, uh, it allows a lot more diversity of plants to grow. Uh, you mow too often and you end up with a lot of, a lot of grasses and a lot of your uh, forbs and, and leg, natural legumes and stuff like that. They just kind of die out with regular mowing. Oh. But then the other extreme is some some organic practices are just let everything grow all summer long and then just cut it once in the fall and and that gives you a different type. Of, it, it doesn't give you the best diversity either because you get a lot of a lot of plants that grow aggressively in the spring and then and then go to seed and in the fall you've got a lot of just brown a brown grass and a not not a good habitat for your environment or for your uh, beneficial insects so. So timed mowings throughout the season using equipment like this, uh, yeah, really makes for a good a good environment in the farm and a uh, nice balance for the beneficial insects and the pests. That, that's really great to hear. Um, especially, I'm a soil scientist by training, so I'm always really interested when uh, people are taking care of their soils well and fostering diversity. Yeah, we we like to say that we've totally abandoned soil chemistry and we're going all with soil biology. That's had to great. had to relearn everything I was taught in soil science as a college <laughs> student. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I guess how has your orchard uh changed over the years? Well, I'm second generation on the farm. Okay. So I my father passed away when I was actually in college, so I, I took over an, an old, um, poorly maintained uh, orchard of standard trees. Um, and I ran that through the, through the 80s, and then in the 90s decided to uh, get out of the orchard business because the old standard trees just weren't weren't doing it. The industry was changing a lot and we went up to the up to the Twin Cities and I worked at the Horticultural Research Center up there for eight years, then came back to our place. So I've been back here for a little over 20 years. Oh, okay. But uh, when I first took over the orchard, we were a conventional orchard, uh, but I had studied integrated pest management, so we, we were always trying to reduce pesticides. Uh, when I came back at, after the after working at the research center, uh, we really got interested in organics and uh, started paying more attention to the diversity in the orchard and the types of products we used. And you know, now we're actually we went from organic to biodynamic, so really have to pay attention to the the total environment. And yeah, I've seen big changes in the orchard. Um, the most visual is first the diversity of birds that are all around the farm. Uh, bluebirds and um, uh, just all kinds of all kinds of different birds that I'm identifying every year. And then uh, the paying attention to taking care of the orchard floor, so we have this diversity of plants and and flowers. Even without reseeding, just by timing the mowings, it allows uh, just the native plants around here to uh, uh, to grow more and, and have less grasses. So that would be the biggest change: is uh, the wildlife 
the bird life mostly, and then the, the orchard floor. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, that's fantastic to hear. So I guess um, if there's no other questions, I want to be respectful of people's time here. Um, we're, we're just about at seven. Oh, here we go. I see chat. Um, so Patrick writes and says, thanks so much for sharing. I'm in the beginning phases of orchards, and I wasn't sure what to do with the pruning material. Yeah, don't waste it. <laughs> Another way to take care of your prunings in a small orchard, and uh, Michael Phillips that wrote the, the apple grower, um, he suggests just making small brush piles in between the apple trees here and there and letting them slowly break down in kind of a natural composting system. So on a small scale, that, that can work pretty well, too, is just make a small pile, throw some of your grass clippings over it, let them, let them break down right there, and then put piles in different places. Otherwise, you'll get, you'll get brush and, uh, I should say, uh, brambles and things growing up in it if you try to do it in the same spot year after year. But that's another way to take care of prunings on a small scale, or before you get your first brush chopper. <laughs> Looks like... We might be out of questions. Um, I think this was a really, really great information about um, how to do this, and I really like the videos. Um, I thought that was really helpful to see the results and see how things, um, how the choppers actually work at different times. Oh, I can make one other comment. If, if sure. somebody's more interested in seeing brush chopping, when I was looking at my videos on YouTube, if you if you just search brush chopping, there's a, a about a fifteen or twenty minute video of uh of another orchard somewhere. They I don't know who it is. But uh you can see them chopping brush under big trees and little trees and the view from the cab and the view from the chopper and <laughs> all the brush chopping video you could hope for. <laughs> That sounds great. Um, Teresa chat wrote a chat. Um, she said, thanks. Uh, your orchard is inspiring. Thank you. Again, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And I really want to thank Harry. This is, this is really great information. Um, and, and again, thank you to the Hegner uh, Family Foundation as well as North Central Fair. Um, they're the ones that supported us, and they're they're the reason that we can bring these uh, nutshell presentations to you for free. So, so a big thank you to them too. Um, and I hope everybody has a great night tonight. So, thanks again. Thanks for listening. <laughs>